something else. Okay, Chemistry 3111. Last class, we finished off the section on oxygen nucleophiles, and now we're into nitrogen nucleophiles. And what's interesting with nitrogen nucleophiles, we are going to look at um, not only a primary amine behaving as a nucleophile, but also a secondary amine behaving as a nucleophile. We end up with different products in each of those cases. So let's take a look at this first reaction of the day here. If you're starting out with an aldehyde, okay, so it says here, ben, this is benzaldehyde, benzaldehyde, and you should know how to name that compound. So it says here, under acidic conditions, an aldehyde or a ketone will react with a primary amine to form an imine. So this is key. When you take a primary amine and react it with an aldehyde or a ketone, you get an imine. So this functional group here, brand new functional group, you've got a double bond on the nitrogen. The nitrogen also has a lone pair on it and um, it has your alkyl group on it, and that gives you an imine. Something interesting about imines is that they used to be called shift bases, so they were actually named after a person. We used to call them a shift base or a shift, yeah, you know, just imine. Whenever you say a shift base, a chemist will know that you're talking about an imine. So imine or shift base, it means the exact same thing. Um, and you probably noticed what the reagents were in here. Of course, you need the methylamine, right? So you need the the primary amine, and again, notice that this is a primary amine, right? A primary amine is one where you have RNH2, okay? Then we have a catalytic amount of acid. So put here, this is our acid catalyst. And we always write here negative H2O. That just means removal of water, right? Water is lost um, in this reaction. And something that's not shown on this slide but is of interest to us is if you try the same reaction, so I'm going to rewrite benzaldehyde here. And instead of using a primary amine with an alkyl group, if you just use plain old ammonia, NH3, okay, we'll put here minus H2O, you still get an imine or a shift base, except now your R group is not going to be a carbon base group. It's just going to be a hydrogen. So you would end up with this, okay? So a primary amine, it gives you an imine with an alkyl group subst substituted on it. But if you use ammonia, you end up with just a nitrogen there. All right. And you need to know both of these reactions. Now, like I told you before I started recording today, our book goes into quite a bit of detail about the mechanism of this reaction. Um, hear it directly from my mouth. I will not ask you this mechanism. However, it is worth looking at. You see, the very first thing that happens here is a nucleophilic attack. All right, look at that. The first thing that happens is a nucleophilic attack by the amine on the carbonyl, and you might be thinking, well, that's not that interesting, okay? Well, hold the phone. If you remember, when we looked at oxygen nucleophiles, the first step was always protonation of the oxygen to make an oxonium ion. Do you remember that from the acid part, right? That was the first step was making this, right, which is a really powerful electrophile, but we don't see that in this case, right? We're under, um, we're not under strongly acidic conditions. We're under um, conditions where we have the free amine um, uh, here, and then we also have the protonated form of the amine. So we have both in equilibrium with each other. And again, I'm not going to ask you a whole lot of details about that, but first we start with our nucleophilic attack, then we have a proton transfer. And so if you're wondering, what's this HA plus thing here, okay? Well, what that is, is you're going to have some of the amine, right, this amine, but you're also going to have some of its, maybe I'll write it in red like it is here, you're also going to have some of its protonated form, okay? So where you have an extra hydrogen and that serves as your acid. So um, after you do the proton transfer, you do a second proton transfer and you end up with this intermediate called a carbonylamine. You should be able to recognize a carbonylamine. It's a new functional group. I didn't mention it before I started lecture today, but you should know what a carbonylamine is. You can see that it's a carbon atom that has an alcohol attached to it and an amine basically attached to the same carbon. So our carbonyl amine, and you can see that at this point, we still haven't lost water. And so we need to protonate the hydroxyl to turn it into a good leaving group. Then we do a proton transfer at the end. And there you go, we've made our amine. So again, I won't ask you this mechanism from you know, soup to nuts or anything, but you should have an idea of what, uh, what's going on in the mechanism. So just a little bit about these whole acidic conditions thing here, okay? It says, even though it's under acidic conditions, protonation of the carbonyl was not the first step in the imine formation, right? You saw that. The first step was a nucleophilic attack, right? 
because we know that if you have an amine um, present and it reacts with a strong acid catalyst like HCl, it's the equilibrium is going to lie completely. It's going to lie completely to this side. And so that's why we use an acid catalyst, right? We don't use a stoichiometric amount. We just use maybe 0.1 mole percent or something like that. So it says here that the ammonium ion, this guy, is not acidic enough to protonate an aldehyde or a ketone, but it is acidic enough to pro uh, transfer a proton to the oxygen that has a negative charge in the second step. So it's acidic enough to do that, but it's not acidic enough to protonate this, all right? And so when you're doing this kind of reaction to form these imines, you actually have to have the pH just right. It has to be right around five, otherwise the reaction is too slow, right? If you're at a lower pH, all the, pro all the amines are protonated, so you get none of them that are available to do the first step. They can't do the nucleophilic attack. And if you're at a lower pH, you have none of them that are protonated, so they can't um, drive the reaction forward, okay? I've never asked my students about this. I've never said, oh, what's the correct pH for this reaction to be run at? You should have an idea, I guess. It's in the slides and it's in the notes, but um, I won't be asking you too much details about that. So we already saw that when you have a primary amine, Right, let's go over here, okay? So if we have a primary amine, amine, that gives us an imine or a shift base. And now what we're gonna see is if you use a secondary amine and you react it under acidic conditions with an aldehyde or a ketone, we get a new functional group that's called an enamine. And you're probably figuring this out already, that in an enamine, in this new functional group, you've got an alkene, right, for ene, and then you have an amine for, uh, you guessed it, amine, there you go. So that's where the name enamine comes from. And if you're looking at the reaction conditions and saying, well, it looks pretty much identical, the only difference is you've replaced the primary amine with a secondary amine, I'd say you're absolutely right. However, you get a markedly different product, don't you? Instead of the double bond being between the carbon and the nitrogen, it's between um, the carbon that's attached to a nitrogen and one of its neighboring carbon. So maybe you could call this the alpha and the beta carbon, something like that. And again, this reaction requires acidic conditions to work. And the, the mechanism is the exact same as imine formation. That's good news. It's identical. The only difference is the very last step, right? And it has to be different because if you remember, a shift base didn't look like this, right? A shift base looked like this, okay? That's what we got from a primary amine. We had the double bond between the carbon and the nitrogen. And now it's between two carbon atoms. So let's take a look. Again, first step, nucleophilic attack, then a proton transfer by the conjugate acid of the, of the, um, of the amine, right? Then we do a, so two successive proton transfers. We go through the carbonyl amine, we lose water. And then you can see in the very last step, there is a proton transfer, or again, if you were to call this the alpha carbon and this is the beta carbon, where you abstract a proton from the beta carbon and restore neutrality to the nitrogen, and you end up forming a double bond between this alpha and beta carbon, if you will. So we end up with a brand new functional group, the enamine. So again, to repeat myself like an old man, uh, primary amine or ammonia, you get an imine. And if you use a secondary amine, you get, um, you get an enamine. Well, of course, a tertiary amine is not going to work in this case, right? A tertiary amine will not work. And the reason why is you cannot do a proton transfer in this step here, you've got to have um, a proton on your molecule uh, in order to do that. And if you've got three R groups, you can't do that. All right. So with that in mind, let's take a look here. It says uh, just kind of a summary here. Again, primary amine, and we'll put here or NH3 is going to give you an, an imine. And if you have a secondary amine, it's going to give you an enamine. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me just on the two new functional groups, imine, enamine. All right. Yeah, and of course, like I say, if you ever want to interrupt me and ask me a question along the way, I have no problem with it. You know, it's not, I, you know, I taught the class enough that I don't have to glance at my notes all that much. I usually don't stare at them or anything like that, but I just noticed something in my notes that you guys might find uh, interesting. Whenever my students give me a mnemonic that they make up, I usually write it down. At least I try to. And the, the one that I saw here is this. Somebody had written this. They said imine, and then they said, um, so what would it be? 
amine. Okay, so they said is primary amine gives you an imine, and secondary gives you right. This looks like the letter E, and you put a little hat on the top. Enamine. If you find that useful, that's great. And if not, you're just you can just laugh at it or whatever. But anyhow, my students told me that, or somebody did at one point. Anyhow, students always come up with the best mnemonics, better than I could ever come up with. Anyhow, will anybody use that? Remember it that way? Maybe, yeah, maybe no. Okay, I'm getting a no, so I'll just move on from there and move on to something else. All right, so I'm gonna teach you a new reaction. Somebody says, I like it, okay. So, hey, Jay Lynn, I got one for you. Do you remember this reaction? You remember this old chestnut here that we learned just a couple of days ago where you took a carbonyl and then you treated it with a zinc mercury amalgam in HCl, and then we heated that up. Does anybody remember the name of this reaction? And if you can't remember it, it's, it's all good. Anybody remember the name of this reaction? Starts with the letter C. Yeah, thanks, Tiana. Clemenson, right? Clemenson, Clemenson, can I spell that? Reduction is what it's called. Yeah, thanks, Maria, thanks, Tiana, perfect, yeah. So, um, you know, there's a reaction that's very, Similar in scope, I guess you would say, to the Clemenson. It's a reaction called the Wolf Kishner reaction. So, Wolf Kishner um, is another way to reduce a carbonyl from a ketone to an alkane. Okay, it's a two step process. Um, what you do first is you form an imine. So, this is an imine that we form here. Okay, and this compound here, this is called hydrazine. Hydrazine. Um, that imine is technically called a, hyd um, a hydrazone. So that would be a better name for it. I would call it a hydrazone. Hydrazone. Okay. So first you take hydrazine and this compound looks really weird. It looks like amino amine or something. Anyhow, it's just a liquid at room temperature and it's pretty easy to work with. But you take hydrazine and you just treat your ketone with hydrazine and a catalytic amount of acid, you get the hydrazone. But then, and I mean, this is an old, old reaction. You'd have to fact, I'm not sure what year. Wolf Kishner developed this, but I know it was a long time ago. Okay. Any reaction conditions that are just potassium hydroxide and cook it up, right? It's a very old reaction, but it's also a very great reaction. Why do chemists love this reaction? Because it makes a gas as a product, and that gas goes where? Up the smokestack. So that means this reaction is not going backwards, right? It's just going to go forward, and it works really, really well. So again, the first step is the formation of that hydrazone, which is like an amine, I guess. And um, yeah, so there you go, the Wolf-Kishner reaction. Can I just address one thing uh, before we move on? And I think I've brought this up before, is that um, I had a student a number of years ago who really got driven, just it would drive her nuts when she'd look at reactions and say, why do I have to know two ways of doing something? So it's it's because of her, and I thank her for, for asking that question. You know, the reason why I brought this reaction up first is in case somebody's wondering, well, why am I learning two ways to do the same thing? Because we're actually going to look at another way to do this today, okay? You're going to learn three ways to do the same reaction. Okay, so the reason why a chemist has to know more than one way to do a reaction is it's pretty simple. It's that, you know, what is research? Right, research is making new molecules that nobody has ever made before. I mean, there's it's pointless to sit in your laboratory laboratory and work on molecules that people have made. So let's say you have a brand new molecule; it's never been made before, um, and you want to reduce a carbonyl of a ketone down to an alkane. Well, what you would do is you would try all the methods there are. You would try the Wolf Kishner. You would try the Clemenson. You would try what we're going to talk about in a minute, which is called Rainy Nickel, and you would just evaluate all three of them and say, well. You know, the Wolf Kishner gets a 90% yield, but the other two give me a 40% yield. Well, you're going to go with the one that gives you the higher yield. And if your next question is, well, how do you, well, can't you just know that? Which one's going to give you a better yield? No, you really don't, especially if you're working with a brand new molecule. You not, might not be sure of, of every nuance that it can have. And so that's why they call it research, right? Where you do, you do it over and over. And so that's why a good chemist has to know more than one way to do the same thing. We, we try different things uh, that, if, that should affect the same result all the time, but we get different yields, you know? So that's the reason why. And this is a mechanism that is known really, really well is the Wolf-Kishner mechanism. I'm gonna put this in here as a mechanism that you should know. 
And the reason why is I've seen, um, I saw a part of this mechanism asked on an ACS before. So I assume that it would be, you know, kind of a fair game on an MCAT or DAT or something like that too. And you can see that all it is is a bunch of proton transfers and the loss of nitrogen. It's nothing more than that. Okay, it's all there is to it, right? You do a proton transfer here, you draw a residence form, you protonate this carbanion, you do another proton transfer here, you protonate this carbanion, and when you protonate that carbanion, in the meantime, you end up losing nitrogen, right? So you lose, it says nitrogen gas is expelled. Um, oops, I wasn't supposed to do that. But anyhow, it's expelled generating a carbanion. So again, if you lose a gas, great reaction, right? It's going to go forward. It's not going to go in reverse. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on the idea of the Wolf Kishner. You might be thinking, well, I'm going to have to look at this mechanism a couple of times, Mr. Dion. I can't learn this in, you know, two shakes of a land sale. I wouldn't expect you to, all right? Now, this is a Dr. Klein note. This is something that he puts in the textbook. I was never taught this. Um, I mean, I guess I was, but in not the same way. Just all he's saying here is, Notice the similarities between um, all the acid catalyzed mechanisms that we looked at. So, you know, he's really saying 19.5 and 19.6. Notice that whenever anything is done in an acid catalyst, that little H plus in square brackets, everything should either be plus one or neutral. If you, and that means overall. If you've got something that's got a negative charge overall, I mean the entire intermediate or the entire molecule, you, there's, something's gone wrong. You know, Phil Collins said something happened on the way to heaven, right? So something went seriously wrong there. All right. So that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, again, it's not the way I was taught, but uh, I think it is something that's very pertinent to us to think about. So let's just see if we can draw some products. No mechanisms here. It just says take these carbonyl compounds. The first one is cycloheptanone. The second one is cyclopentanone. And we're going to react them with some amines and we're going to draw the major products. So I have, in the first one, I have ammonia, okay, which is going to be my nucleophile. So could anybody tell me what kind of functional group is going to be found in my final product? And it's not a trick question. It's something we looked at today. What functional group would we get if we react ammonia with a ketone? Loss of water. It's going to be the imine, exactly. In this case, you're going to get an imine, yep. So we're going to make an imine that's going to look something like this. So we have our double bond. And now we replace the oxygen with a nitrogen. And the R group that's going to be attached to it here is going to be a hydrogen atom. And that's it. So we make an imine, which is also, again, called a shift base. If we look at the next one, it's cyclopentanone. Um, here we have cyclopropylamine. That's the name of this compound. This is a primary amine. And so what's the functional group we're going to see in the final product? Not a trick question. Remember, it's a primary amine. What will we get? An imine again, exactly. We're going to make an imine again. So what's it going to look like? You're going to have your five-membered ring, your double bond. But now instead of an, an oxygen, you've got a nitrogen. And it's going to be attached to this cyclopentyl group like this. So you make an imine again. Okay. So just to review, if we go back here, okay, if you use a primary amine or ammonia, you get an imine. When you use a secondary amine, you make an enamine. Okay. So let's keep that in our mind's eye as we move on to the next practice problem. Well, let me just find it here. Okay. So this one, we're working with primary amines again, aren't we? But one of them has an hydroxyl, an OH group as its R group, and the other one has an NH2 group. So you might remember that I told you the name of this compound, NH2, NH2. This is called hydrazine. And this compound over here, this OH, um, NH2, that's called hydroxylamine. Yeah, that's literally, so it's called hydroxyl. I mean, anyhow, the name is neither here nor there. But in both of these cases, we're going to get something that looks like an enamine, right? Because there's only one R group on this, which is the OH group. And so we're going to draw this chain. Then we've got our double bond to our nitrogen. But now, instead of a hydrogen or an R group, we've got an OH group 
like this. And this functional group has a name. This is called an oxime. An oxime or an oxime, depending on who you talk to. I always grew up calling it an oxime. That's what we called it in my family. Kidding. Anyhow, so we make an oxime. And in the second one, we're taking hydrazine. So we're going to make a hydrozone. And so we're going to draw our five-membered ring, our double bond, our nitrogen, and now we have NH2 like that. There you go. So again, this is called a hydra, a hydrozone. All right. And if you're wondering, you know, like what's the purpose of these functional groups? They can be used to make different aromatic compounds. Uh, a, an aromatic compound, I don't know if we ever discussed this compound here, but this compound is called isoxazole. So isoxazole. And you have to make an oxime sometimes to prepare isoxazole. And then for the hydrozone, you could make you could use that to make a lot of different types of aromatic compounds. But just one that I have written down in my notes is what's called an oxidiazole, which looks like this. It's another aromatic compound. Looks something like this. So this is an oxidiazole. Yeah, oxidiazole. There we go. Anyhow, so that's the purpose of those. Let's try another one here. It says predict the product of each of the following reactions. So here, what kind of amine do I have here? Is this primary, secondary, or tertiary? Not a trick question. Yeah, secondary. So if we're taking a secondary amine, Tiana, and reacting it with a ketone, what functional group are we going to get in the end, Sydney? Hong, anybody? I'll take Lin. Korea, whoever's there. Anybody? Exactly. Thanks, Sydney. Exactly. Thank you. It's going to be an, an enamine. Perfect. Okay. So let's draw this enamine very carefully. So first, we're going to draw the five-membered ring that did have the carbonyl on it. Now we're going to draw a single bond to nitrogen like this. We're going to put the two R groups on the nitrogen, so the two cyclohexyl groups, one, two. And the double bond is going to be between the carbon that the carbonyl is attached to and the neighboring carbon, so that it's going to be right here. Okay, so there's your in amine. All right, and the next one is the same thing because you have a secondary amine here, and then you have a ketone here, but you're going to make a cyclic species, right? Because this nitrogen is going to be attached to this carbon, right? And you're going to get rid of the carbonyl and you're going to get rid of this hydrogen, right? When you lose water. Okay, so how are you gonna draw the product here? The way you're gonna do it is very carefully, okay? What we're gonna do is we're gonna count the carbons. Okay, so you're gonna lose this oxygen, you're gonna lose this hydrogen. What you're gonna count is this, one, two, three, four, five. So you're gonna have a five-membered ring, right? Because this nitrogen is gonna be tied to this carbon number one. So we've got a five-membered ring. So let's just start by drawing a five-membered ring. We number this again, one, two, three, four, five. We'll draw a five-membered ring off of our aromatic. So we'll start with the aromatic. It's just a matter of counting carbons very carefully. So one, two, three, four, five, like that. Okay, now let's number them. One, two, three, four, five, like that. So atom number five should be our nitrogen, shouldn't it? Right, we'll put our nitrogen right here, and what's going to be attached to it is this R group. So we're going to have our R group still on it, like that. On carbon number three, we've got two methyl groups. We didn't even touch those. And could anybody tell me which two atoms is the double bond going to be between in our enamine? And it's not a trick. Which two carbons would, it, would the enamine be in between? It's going to be between one and two, exactly. It's going to be right there, exactly. So there you go. We call this an instead of an intermolecular, or sorry, in, intramolecular. Um, yeah, intramolecular reaction. We call this an intermolecular reaction. So both reactants are in the same molecule, if you will. All right, there we go. So we've made some enamines, and that brings us to section nineteen point seven. So we've covered the first section of the day. Section nineteen point six is in the books. All right, we'll take a deep breath because we're getting into something new. And hopefully you remember that we talked about the formation of an acetal. If you don't remember, let's go down to our 
wheel of reactions, as we call it, okay? Wheel of reactions, okay. So what have we covered so far? We covered hydrates in the last lecture. We covered acetals, cyclic acetals. Today we've covered imines, enamines, um, uh, oxymes, and hydrozones. So we've covered all of those things. And now what we're going to get into is we're going to get into breaking an acetal. So taking the acetal and going backwards, so taking this reaction and reversing it. Now what I want you to notice is that when you form an acetal, so both of these reactions are the formation of an acetal. So this one and this one, right? Those are both forming oxygen-based acetals. Notice what they have in common. In both of them, you lose water. In both of them, you have a catalytic amount of acid, okay? So with that in mind, let's go back to where we were, section 19.7. So just bear with me as I find it. Um, it's gonna take me a second here. There we go, okay. So now what we're gonna do is we're, instead of removing water, remember I told you to use a special piece of equipment to remove water. Now we're gonna saturate the acetal with water and throw a little bit of acid at it and that's gonna run the reaction in reverse, right? Because I told you that the reaction wouldn't move forward unless you removed water. And so now if we add water, right? If we run the reaction in water and then we give a little bit of acid to it, it's gonna reverse the reaction completely so we're going to break, break our acetal and reform our ketone or aldehyde. And what's interesting to know is that although this reaction works really, really well with acid, okay, you cannot do this reaction in base. It doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. So if you take an acetal, you treat it with base, nothing is going to happen. I can tell you from personal experience that some acetals are so acid labile, if you just bring them in the proximity of the slightest amount of acid, they end up getting broken, but they are super resistant to strong base. So just keep that in mind. So if you're wondering about the hydrolysis of an acetal, and if you're looking at this slide and saying, oh no, another mechanism, I got some good news for you then. I want you to understand this mechanism, but this mechanism is the exact opposite of the formation of an acetal. That's based on something called the principle of microscopic reversibility. If a mechanism goes, you know, a certain way in one direction, in the reverse direction, it's the exact opposite arrows. You just reverse all the arrows and you're done. So what you can see is that the acetal is still going to pass through the hemiacetal before it goes back to your ketone or aldehyde. Similarly, if you hydrolyze an imine, so this is an, an imine or an enamine, okay, even though the mechanisms aren't in here, the mechanisms are the reverse of the formation of the imine and the enamine. And so um, all we have to do is just saturate the compound with water, a little bit of acid, and that's going to break the whole thing. It takes it right back from where we start to, to where we started at the very beginning. So we end up going back to our ketone or aldehyde. Now, instead of writing H2O and H plus, I'm also going to accept this. If you just wrote H3O plus, you know what? That's good enough for Mr. Dion, okay? That's totally acceptable. I don't think you have to write H plus in square brackets and H2O. In fact, I usually don't, and you can see that he didn't either in this slide. So, <laughs> excuse me. All we're doing is we're taking some acetals, an imine, another acetal, and an enamine, and we're cleaving them, okay? Using, you notice that this is the exact same reaction conditions every time. It's just aqueous acid, right? So we're saturating the compound with water, throwing a little bit of acid at it, and we're going to end up breaking our acetal or whatever we have here. So let's start with the first one, okay? Could anybody tell me what functional group is there in this compound? And it, again, there's no questions designed to fool you. What functional group is found in this compound? I have a carbon here, and it's like it's got an ether here. And it's got a no, it's got another ether here. It's like a carbon with two ethers on it, right? So this is an acetal. Exactly. This is an oops, an acetal. Somebody said a cyclic acetal. Yes, it's an acetal. Okay. So what we're gonna do is if we destroy the acetal, it's gonna go back to what? It's gonna be reverted or converted back into the ketone. So if this is the carbon that is attached to the two oxygens, we're just gonna make it a double bond to oxygen now. So look, we're gonna draw our five-membered ring, okay? 
there's this carbon. I know this isn't proper structure drawing, but I'm just doing it for instructional purposes. So now that carbon is going to have a double bond to oxygen, and there's our ketone. And the diol is going to be coming from all of this part here. So you have a hydroxyl, and then you have one, two, three carbons. So one, two, three, and then another alcohol, and you're done, just like that. So that's the diol that we get, and that is the ketone that we get. Okay, what about the next one? Could anybody tell me what functional group is found in this compound? We've got a carbon with a double bond of nitrogen here. A functional group is this one. Exactly, exactly. It's an imine, right? Okay, so let's scribble that down. This is an imine, and we're treating it with aqueous acid. So what we're going to do is we're going to cleave right here. Okay, so all we have to do is draw the carbon skeleton put our double bond and we put an oxygen on the end like that. Okay, that's for the left-hand side. The other part is gonna be our primary amine, which is just gonna be this compound here. We call that methyl amine. Give me a thumbs up if you see that. All right, the methyl amine comes from this portion here. So that's where the methyl amine comes from. And then the rest of the molecule, the ketone, comes from this compound. All right. Uh, what kind of functional group is found in the next compound? In C. Can anybody tell me what functional group is found in this, this bad boy right here? It's an acetal, right? Exactly. It's an acetal. The only difference is, Tiana, right? If I, draw, if I redraw this compound, it's going to look like this. So we have something that looks like this and something that looks like this. It's still like this is a carbon oxygen carbon and this is carbon oxygen carbon. So it's an acetal. The only thing is now your R groups are just two hydrogen atoms, right? So we're going to end up breaking those bonds. So let me just erase this. Okay. We're going to end up breaking the bonds between the carbon and um, the oxygen like this. And this carbon is going to have a double bond to oxygen on it. So it's going to have a double bond to oxygen, and then it's also going to have two hydrogen atoms. So that's formaldehyde. And then the diol that we're going to get is going to have a hydroxyl. One, two, there we go. And then we're going to have these two geminal dimethyl groups like that. All right. And who could tell me what functional group is found in the very last compound, this bicyclic compound? Could anybody name the functional group in there? It's an enamine, right? Thanks, Juan. Exactly, it's an enamine. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna break this bond here between the carbon and the nitrogen, and we're gonna redraw the bridged bicyclic, oops, where's my black pen? Here we go. Gonna redraw the bridged bicyclic, just gonna look like that. And now this carbon is gonna have a double bond to oxygen, and our secondary amine is going to be this guy, this is called dimethylamine. All right. Maybe I can spruce that up a little bit. There we go. All right. So there we go. So now you know um, oxygen nucleophiles to make um, hemiacetals and acetals. And we looked at how to make imines and enamines and hydroxamines or oxymes and hydrozones. And then we looked at their cleavage. This is what's covered in section 19.7. We said if you know the mechanism of formation of any of those, then you know the mechanism of the hydrolysis because it's the same curved arrows, it's just in reverse. And so that brings me to section 19.8, which is where we're gonna change the atom again. So we've covered oxygen, and oxygen is done, and nitrogen is done, and now we're gonna move into sulfur nucleophiles. And instead of making an acetal, we're gonna use two equivalents of a thiol. So remember, if you have R, SH, this is called a thiol. Okay, so we're going to take a thiol, two equivalents of them, with the catalytic amount of acid. And now instead of an acetal, we call it a thiol acetal. And of course, if you use this compound here, this is called 1, 2, ethane dithiol. If you use that, you end up with a cyclic thiol acetal. So a thiol acetal, cyclic thiol acetal, two brand new functional groups. Remember, what drives the mechanism forward here, what drives the reaction forward 
is the removal of water. So you use that special apparatus that I told, told you is called a Dean Stark, and you use that to remove water um, in this reaction. So thioacetal. All right, and it turns out that just like the Clemenson and the Wolf Kishner, um, you can take a carbonyl. So again, if you take a carbonyl compound like a ketone, and you treat this with, let's just practice here. So one, two, ethane diphyol, catalytic amount of acid, removal of water, you make the thioacetal. Then you can use this re a reagent called, um, <clears throat> excuse me, rainy nickel, and that will convert the thioacetal down to the alkane. Notice that there's no mechanism provided for this reaction, not even close. And I think the reason why is that the mechanism might not be that well understood. And it's probably better understood than I think. But uh, I don't remember the last time I looked at this mechanism, so don't worry about that at all. And a funny thing about, well, not funny, but an interesting thing about rainy nickel is that it's pyrophoric. So pyro, can I spell that right? Pyrophoric. Does anybody know what pyrophoric means? It means it ignites spontaneously in air. So rainy nickel, yeah, yeah, it catches on fire, Maria. It catches on fire when you open it to the air. So rainy nickel is kind of challenging to work with. I mean, if you know what you're doing, it's not that bad. But anyhow, so there you go. So now we have another method for taking a ketone or an aldehyde and reducing it down to an alkane. So now you have three methods. You've got, like I told you, you've got Clemenson. Clemenson. We've got Wolf Kishna. Oops. Wolf Kishner, and then you have Rainy Nickel. Yeah, somebody said it sounds like a safe reaction. Um, I'm not making light of it, Tiana. If you know what you're doing, it's not that bad. But yes, if you didn't know what you're doing, it would be very, very dangerous. I worked with a guy who was a real expert on Rainy Nickel. So I learned a few tricks from him along the way. All right. So let's see if we can answer some questions here um, using rainy nickel. Okay, so let's predict the major product for each of the following. We've got this carbonyl. Let's draw the intermediate. Let's draw the, the product of the first step. What the hell? Okay, so after the first step, we make the thioacetal, which is gonna look a little something like this. Go, so there's our thioacetal. And then after treatment with rainy nickel, it just goes down to an alkane. So we'll use that. Chizoink. And there we go. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me again. All right. Same thing for, for the next one. The difference is this one is a ketone. And this one is an aldehyde. But just do the exact same thing, right? After the first step, where's my blue pen? After the first step, you just make the thioacetal. So we'll put this hydrogen here, so thioacetal. And then in the second step, you reduce it. So look what you end up with. You end up with this, okay? You have a hydrogen here, and then you've got two more hydrogens here that you installed. So it's nothing more than this. It's just two methyl butane that you end up with in this, um, in this reaction. So nothing that exciting. I don't know why you'd want to make two methyl butane so bad, but. You're like, I'll get out some pyrophoric chemicals and make 2-methylbutane the most boring alkane I can think of. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, exactly. Audrey says, woo. Who knows what people's rationale are? I don't know, Audrey. You think you'd be able to just buy that compound for two cents a liter or something, but I don't know. People come up with all kinds of crazy ideas, I guess. Anyhow, before we take a break, I know we've been going for a little while here, but I want to go over a little bit of section 19.9. Why? Because it's mostly review. Yeah, it's mostly review. These are two reagents that you've seen already many, many times in the class, right? Lithium, aluminum hydride, and sodium borohydride. We covered these all the way back in chapter 12, okay? So there's nothing new here for you, really. Um, the idea is that, why, and if you're like, well, why are they showing up in this chapter again? Well, chapter 12 was about alcohols, okay? And then chapter 19 is about aldehydes and ketones. So that's why. One is about the product, one's about the reactant. Anyhow, so you guys probably remember that if you take um, a ketone or aldehyde and treat it with sodium borohydride, that's a one-step reaction. So you can combine it with methanol, ethanol, water as your solvent. 
Whereas lithium aluminum hydride is a much stronger reducing agent. And so it has to be done in two steps. The first step is LAH, and then the second step is going to be to treat it with water or mild acid. But keep a note here, it says that these re reductions are carried out under basic conditions. Why? Because you have a hydride, and a hydride is a strong nucleophile, right? It's H minus. You can't have that under a positive environment. It would protonate it, right? So um, again, this is a mechanism that we covered in chapter 12. No, no kidding, okay? This is a chapter 12 mechanism, right? The hydride attacks the carbonyl. You make an oxide. It gets protonated by water in the second step, and you could even put aqueous acid, like I said, and I would accept that, all right? Something that I don't remember if I covered this with you or not in chapter 12. I'm getting my classes maybe a little mixed up here. But um, if you have an, uns an unsymmetrical ketone, like this compound here, this, as you know, this is butanone. Okay. Remember that this carbon is sp2 hybridized, so it's trigonal. Eh, it's trigonal planar, and therefore it's flat, and therefore the hydride can come in and attack from either face of the molecule. Right, so you'd end up with a pair of um, enantiomers in this case, so you end up with a racemic mixture. Anyhow, so um, I said I was going to stop there, didn't I? But let's just go over Green Yard quickly, because that's a review too, right? I know you spent a lot of time working very hard on Green Yard chemistry in, um, in Chapter 12, and I'm sure that for the people who are enrolled in the lab right now, I'm sure that Dr. Or Mr. Geiger is doing something with respect to Green Yard chemistry because I know he's a real expert in that kind of chemistry. And so, um, you know, if you're like, well, didn't we learn this before? Yeah, okay. But remember, before Green Yard showed up in the alcohols chapter, now it's showing up again in the ketone and aldehyde chapter. So that's why it shows up a couple times in the book. So remember, if you take a ketone and treat it with a Green Yard, you get a secondary alcohol. So ketone gives you secondary alcohol. Okay, and if you take an aldehyde, you get a, um, did I say secondary alcohol when I went, Mr. Dion, for shame, tertiary alcohol. And when you take an aldehyde, you end up making a secondary alcohol. Thanks for not stopping me there. And again, notice that if you're making a chiral center, it's going to be racemic. Why? Because the green yard can attack from either face of the molecule. Again, why is that? It's because the sp2 hybridized carbon is trigonal planar. And it says here, remember that the conditions are consistent with basic conditions, right? If you put an acid in here, that would destroy your green yard. I don't notice students doing that all that much whenever we practice this kind of stuff. So I'm not, it doesn't stress me out that much, but it is a valid point. And Dr. Klein thinks it's, it's relevant. So I'm going to defer to him since he's the real expert. So um, section 19.10 deals with a brand new functional group uh, as well. Um, and again, this is just a continuing on in 19.10, something called a cyanohydrin. You probably noticed this in the wheel of reaction, so to speak. A brand new functional group. And what I think it would be relevant to do is if you haven't read the textbook already, would be for us to take a short break now. And for you to, if, if we're going to take a little break, and um, I'd like you to either, or try to, if you haven't, read, read the part on cyanohydrins and then skim over the part about Wittig chemistry, okay? before we get into it, because it gets, um, I wouldn't say heavy, but it's really important that you understand Wittig chemistry, such an important reaction. You can see there's some variations on it that we look at too. There's quite a few slides, whoops, on the Wittig chemistry. And so, yeah, I want you to take the time to look at that, son of a gun, because it shows up on ACS, it shows up on MCAT, it shows up on DAT, all that good stuff. So the Wittig reaction, very, very important reaction. And let me go back here. Where's the first page on Wittig? Is this one here? Is that Wittig won a Nobel Prize? Okay, so we'll put here um, Nobel Prize in 1979. So the same year that the Dukes of Hazard came on the air. Well, what do you know? The Wittig reaction um, uh, inventor won a Nobel Prize for it. All right, so let's take a short break and then we'll come back and we'll talk about cyanohydrins. Okay, so I want you to make sure that you just scan this at least. And then um, we're also going to get into the Wittig reaction, which is a really important reaction in organic chemistry. And somebody won a Nobel Prize for it. 